this is Professor Malcolm Clark, and some people have told me that he's probably the one person who, most, who knows most about uh, squid and sperm whales in the world. So this is a capacity, and you have a chance uh, to be with him for a while. Uh, what, do you, what do you say if someone acclaims you as being one of the foremost researchers in the field of squids and sperm whales? Well, if you put the two together, there aren't very many people that do those two animals together. I do them together, um, and uh, I'm sort of known in the world of studying squids, and I'm known in the world of studying uh, sperm whales. So, um, yes, sure, there aren't very many people with those dual interests. In fact, there may not only be one. Mm. How come you have these? interests together? Uh, well, uh, um, it came about really because uh, I worked for an institute of oceanography in the UK and um, we were finding terrific difficulty in catching squid. Squids are very difficult to catch in the open ocean. And then I opened a, a sperm whale. Um, uh, prior to that I'd actually worked uh, as a whaling inspector in the Antarctic and I opened sperm whales and I found the most wonderful big squids uh, which were far and above bigger than anything that man ever catches and of totally different species. So the sperm whale uh, stomachs provided me with all these new uh, interesting species and uh, when I got back to England I found that uh, no one really except uh, a Russian, had looked at these um, from uh, the point of view of finding out uh, what they were and what interest they had. So it all came really through the sperm whale and after that, although I studied uh, um, the other squids uh, most of the time, um, the squids that were caught in nets and uh, I sort of developed methods of catching, catching them, uh, I couldn't ever do anything like as well as looking in predators' stomachs and uh, the best predator to look at uh, for many of the squids was the sperm whale because it eats so much and uh, so that sort of developed that link. So your initial interest was in the sperm whale as uh, someone yielding the objects of your research to you. But uh, then you became interested in the sperm whale themselves. Yes. How, how did that happen? Yes. Well, what aroused your interest there? Um, well, I got interested in the uh, spermaceti of the sperm whale because that's, uh, um, apart from, uh, the, the, well, physiologically the sperm whale is doing a very extraordinary thing. It's going from uh, the pressure of one atmosphere uh, and in a, a short time going to very high pressure in the sea of uh, something like a hundred atmospheres. So that it, it's, it's having a tremendous change in life and if you look at other things that it changes as it dives so the light disappears. It First of all all the red light and, and yellow light disappear and uh, it goes down uh, and it goes into a blue world and then into a black world quite quickly. The te intensity of the light drops off tremendously fast in, in the sea. So it's, going, it's changing to a, a black. Uh, it's um, getting much lower temperature because the temperature of the sea drops as you go down. Uh, and uh, it's also um, getting uh, a change in pressure. And the change in pressure combined with the change in temperature mean that its, its density changes relative to the water. The density gets, the, the water gets sort of thicker and heavier and so it's got this problem that it, it is pushing to go down. Well the sperm whale spends a large proportion of its time uh, diving deep for food for the squid. And, uh, so it's, it's got all these difficult problems um, to deal with and I got very 
uh, fascinated by how it dealt with these problems uh, when no other animal, as anything like as big, um, could do it. Some smaller ones do it, but they have slightly different problems. So that made me think of the problems it was facing and what special um, anatomical and physiological tricks it had to deal with it. And uh, of course the, the big difference with a, uh, a sperm whale is it has an enormous nose um, which uh, is very difficult to account for. It's full of a very special wax um, called spermaceti wax and uh, this was the, is the one really defining feature of the sperm whale, its nose full of this wax. And uh, so I uh, found that um, by looking at the nose and, and seeing its structure, everything fitted the theory that what the whale was doing was cooling its nose in order to be in dense deep water so that by cooling its nose it can actually make itself heavier or denser so um, this can match the water so it's like a submarine that changes its specific weight in order to dive yes and uh, changes the weight again over to sur surface so the that's right well has a has an apparatus that allows for that yes it probably doesn't use it actually for the it it, um, it helps it down and it helps it up possibly but the critical thing is when it's down there uh, it can adjust to the buoyancy of the water so that it doesn't have to keep swimming to stay down and a, a, a sperm whale of about 45 tons which is an average big male um, is fighting an upthrust of uh, uh, getting on for a hundred kilos push if it goes into this deep water. Um, it, it, the compression of its lungs changes its density but that all operates in the top 200 meters. If it's going down and wanting to control it below that, uh, deeper than that, then it's got to have some other method. And this is the perfect method because the the wax in the nose uh, actually um, uh, freezes or, or um, goes solid anyway, uh, begins going solid at uh, 30 degrees centigrade. So with its at 38, it has a method of heating it um, and with its, uh, with passages in the nose into which it can take water it has an ideal method of, of um, freezing it. Did I say freezing? Yes. Um, so it's got the, the means to change it. And uh, if you do all the calculations, it has um, the possibility of doing it uh, at, those, at the temperatures that it's at. And this means that anywhere in the world, uh, even at the, in the tropics where the water at the surface might be 27 degrees, um, if it, uh, the whale dives, it can go to 7 degrees. So that it can get a 20 degree change in perhaps 10 minutes. And this is an immense change in temperature and buoyancy um, in a, a short way. So the sperm whale can do do this in the hottest water at the surface or it can do it in the Antarctic where there's very little change between the two. And uh, apart from the advantage it has for balancing when it's down there, when it swims it apparently does a lot of gliding and uh, it, if it's coming down it can glide down if it's changed its density or changing its density and it can glide up as well. So it's got that facility both ways. Otherwise it would have difficulty one way or the other. Anyway, that's the point. <laughs>